What I want to talk to you this morning about, and the Lord's been dealing with me about this, is found in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. If, you'll go, if you want to go there, if not, you can just listen. But 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 says, Now concerning spiritual, now the word gifts there is italicized. That means it is added to the text to give understanding. But it says, Now concerning spiritual, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant or unaware. So, the word spiritual there in the Greek could be translated concerning things that pertain to and of the Holy Ghost. Things that pertain to and are of the Holy Ghost. That could, it could be translated that way. I think it would give a more clear understanding. So what he's talking about here in this chapter, if you'll read the rest of the chapter, it talks about things pertaining to and of the Holy Ghost. Now most of the church, I'd say apart from the Neo-Pentecostal movement, or the new, the new move of the Spirit, or the fresh outpouring of God at the beginning of the 20th century, that most of the church is ignorant concerning the things of the Holy Spirit, and the moving, and the gifts, and the callings, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I know I've had my own experience with the Holy Spirit because He is a person. You know, there are three in heaven that bear record, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. I was discussing with a oneness person not too long ago that the principle of first mention is very important in the Bible. The Bible says there are three. Now these three are one. Well, what's the first mention? Three. Now there are three persons that make up one God. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is love, the Father. There is the object of love, which is the Son. And then there is the medium by which that love is conveyed, and that is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has the same characteristics and possesses the same qualities of the Father and the Son. Amen. He is eternal. He is present with God at the beginning. And, you know, the Bible talks about Him as the Spirit of grace, the Spirit of truth. You know, it, it talks about the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave great importance to the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, he says it's expedient for you, didn't he? It's important for you. Now, personally, me, if old selfish Raj, I would like to have Jesus personally present with me. How about you? Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> I had a dream the other night, and uh, I dreamed that I was following Jesus. And I was trying to get close to him, and he turned around and looked at me, and he said, total and complete obedience. Because I wanted to get close to him. And, and I kept trying to get close to him, and he turned around again and said, total and complete obedience. Well, guess what the message is? Total and complete obedience. So we can be close to Jesus, but only by the Spirit. He's at the right hand of the Father. That's where he's at, as our intercessor, as our high priest, as our mediator, as our surety, as our savior. All those things are part of his present day ministry. That's where he's at. He's the covenant. Jesus is the covenant between you and God. See, you, you don't have a covenant with God apart from Jesus. I mean, you, you know, that's, what, that's, that's the problem is many times people are thinking about the Father, and they're trying to get close to the Father, and they're trying to do it, like, in a sense, personally on their own, but really, the go-between is the Father and the Son, in whom we have access, talking about Jesus, by the Spirit, 
unto the Father. That's what it says in Ephesians, the second chapter. The covenant, Jesus is the covenant. He is the covenant. He is the sacrificial lamb. Okay? The covenant is between Jesus and the Father. That's very important. Because if it was between me and the Father, I could break that covenant very easily through disobedience and sin. But because Jesus and the Father are in covenant together because He is the fountainhead and what is the, the word I'm looking for? Um, I, I looked it up a while ago and I can't think of it now. Progenitor. He is the progenitor of the new creation. He is the origin of the Bible says, of all creation, or the new creation, really. The beginning, the firstborn from the dead. See, he's the one that holds the key. He is, it's an everlasting covenant. Why? Because it's him. He's eternal. The Bible says he, 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 he is high priest according to the power of endless life. So the covenant between the Father and the Son, I'm involved in that. I'm in Him. See, that gives you a surety. Now, people can walk away from God. They can backslide. They can, uh, they can break fellowship with God and walk in darkness. But all they have to do is come back to Jesus. And the covenant's still in force. All they have to do is get back in that place of faith in Him. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're really, truly born again, it is a very strong covenant. I mean, you, you may run, but I'm going to tell you, I know for my own experience that it's not easy to walk away from God. You just look at the children of Israel. They tried, to, they tried to leave God. They tried to go away from God. And God was always pursuing them. And he did whatever it took to bring his people back to himself. He said, I'll draw you with cords of love. Or he said, either I'll put a hook in your jaw. One of the two. But we have a very strong covenant. And I'm not saying that you can't mess your relationship up with God. You can if you leave Jesus. If you lose faith in Christ. If you depart from him. I'm not saying that. But I believe in once you're saved, you're, you always should be saved. I believe in eternal security. But not unconditional eternal security. You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't believe in that. Because a person still has a will. You can read the book of Hebrews and you can... I mean, you, you would have to just be uh, uh, brainwashed or brainwash yourself. I, I, I used to read after people, and they're, they're great theologians, and they're great Greek scholars, but you can tell that they're, and I talked about this word last time I taught, it's called cognitive dissonance, where a person is brainwashed to think in a certain way. Everything they see in the scriptures is in line with what they've been brainwashed, like once saved, always saved, once saved, always saved, once saved, always saved or miracles have passed away, or healing's not up for us today, or tongues are of the devil, and all. You know what I'm saying? You, you, people are brainwashed in that way, and that's all they see in the Scripture. Everywhere, you know, people go this way or that way, they see what they've been taught. It's kind of like a guy told me one time. He said, you open up a, a chest full of ribbons, and there's all different kind of ribbons in there. There's all different colors, blue and red and yellow and orange. And, you know, you go through that chest, they say, pick out all the blue ribbons. And then you go through and pick out all the blue ribbons, and then you ask them, how many red ribbons were there in there? Well, I don't know. I wasn't looking for red ribbons. And it's the same way with the Word of God. People, if they've been taught that something doesn't belong to us today, then they, they don't look for it. They look over it. You know, how can you possibly not see great biblical truths in the Word of God when it's right there in front of your face unless you've been brainwashed or trained not to look for that kind of stuff? You know what I'm saying? 
But it says concerning, let's get back to that. The covenant that we have with God is Jesus. The covenant is between the Father and the Son. That's why Jesus said, I will pray the Father, he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That's a long time. You can't send him away. If anybody could have sent the Holy Spirit away, it would have been me. I've made enough mistakes in my life to where if I'd have been living under the Old Testament, I'd have been stoned and hung on a tree a long time ago. I admire those guys back there because I've made a lot of mistakes. But you know what? He never left me because of the covenant between the Father and the Son. I've made some horrendous mistakes, terrible things, and yet he never left. Now, I'm not telling you to go sin, and, and you know, I'm not telling you to, to vex the Holy Spirit. or to, I've, I've grieved the Holy Spirit before. You know, I've vexed the Holy Spirit before. I've ignored him. You know, I haven't listened to him. And, you know, we shouldn't do that. We should learn how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and walk with Him. You know, we shouldn't fight or resist the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about that. We shouldn't quench the Holy Spirit. You know, and, and he, because He's in us and everywhere we go, He goes. You know, and, and everything we say, He's got to hear. You know, it's like I said last time I taught, my favorite feast is Pentecost. Because oil was poured on leavened bread. Now, leaven is a type of sin. And the Bible said, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Well, he had to. <laughs> because we're all in the flesh. You know, we're all imperfect. We're all full of faults and failures. So he, he chose to anoint us as his vessels, as imperfect vessels. Now, if you go up and read the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll figure out real quick that those people he called saints <laughs> were not very saintly. He called them saints. Now, they were saints because they were sanctified and set apart by God for His service. But that sanctification wasn't mature in their life. They hadn't grown to be sanctified. They hadn't grown to be uh, what the Bible calls telos, which is the Greek word for mature in Christ. What's a mature Christian? Somebody that's filled with God's love and somebody that walks in love and somebody that follows after the love of God. That's a mature Christian. What were the Corinthians? The Bible says there are strife and divisions among you. You know, there was, there was all kind of murmuring and, and, and backbiting and even immorality in the church. But yet they had all the gifts of the Spirit operating. And the word there, spiritual, is, means spiritual endowments. These things are given to people not because they deserve them but because they desire them. So you can be an immature Christian. You can be an undeveloped Christian. You can be a carnal Christian and still have the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life. You can have God use you. I'm talking about people that not, are not even walking in fellowship with God can have the gifts of the Spirit operating in their life and God move through them and yet God is not putting His stamp of approval on people because of the gifts operating through them. That's not, that's not a stamp of personal approval. That's God that says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He doesn't change His mind about gifts that He gives to people. He will manifest himself through a person to bless another person. He will. Now that person 
will not get a reward. The Bible says that if you don't have love, you're zero. So if all you're doing and your gift flowing, and I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were like, you know, some of the meanest people I know, some of the, the meanest people I know are people that are in Pentecost. That's right, ugly and, and, and not patient, not kind, very judgmental, very law-bound, can be in the church operating in gifts and even be in the ministry and have bona fide gifts and callings and yet not walk in love. I mean, it's just a real thing. And don't be disillusioned by it. People used by God for healings and miracles, and then you find out they've got a moral flaw. Maybe they've misused funds. I know there was somebody over in Asia not long ago. They found out a bunch of stuff about somebody over there, a big church over there that had been misappropriating funds. You know, or somebody's having a, 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 an extramarital affair. Or somebody's having a homosexual affair. Uh, lifestyle behind the scenes but yet God was still using that person and people get confused and say wow how can that happen now eventually God will have to judge that person and it will have to be brought out that's why we have to you know that's why it's better to judge yourself than, than to be judged by God the Bible said that, and that's a good thing you know that's nice when you can judge yourself there's a lot of people in the courtroom would love to judge yourself, wouldn't it? But God says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, that's 1 Corinthians 11 chapter, we are chastened of the Lord. That we, there's a lot of difference between chastening and punishment. Somebody did me wrong not too long ago. I mean, did me dirty. I, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. It shocked me completely shocked me just just blindsided how many of you ever been blindsided before <laughs> i mean it shocked me but it didn't surprise me you know why because of human nature betrayal is just a part of the human condition how you handle betrayal will determine your next relationship you know that how you handle it and I told that person, I said, you know, I can't punish you. I can't punish you because Jesus was punished for you. Now, I can make some choices, some informed choices about our relationship, but I can't punish you. You know, the world wants to punish you. But God punished his son so he wouldn't have to punish you. Isn't that great? I love that. None of, the, none of the sacrifices in the Old Testament were tormented. Did you know that? The lambs, the goats, the doves, all, they weren't tormented. Their life was taken from them to cover. But Jesus was tormented. He was tortured. He was punished so you wouldn't have to be punished. And that, I love that. But eventually, God will have to chasten people. He will. Why? That you be not condemned with the world. There's a lot of people that get saved and they get filled with the Holy Spirit. And... They walk in disobedience. They don't, walk, they don't walk in the light of God's Word. You know, they may get involved in sin. They may backslide. They may, they may have a lifestyle of sin. And you know what? Sometimes those people, I know my grandmother, uh, my dad always had a question as to why my grandmother died at a young age. But her, her dad was an Assembly of God minister who had a mission. 
You know the old missions in downtown areas that says Jesus saves? That's the kind of mission my great-grandfather had. And he would take people in off the streets and feed them and preach. He said, before you eat, you've got to hear a sermon. So he'd make them listen to the sermon before he fed them. And then he had a ranch out uh, by Weatherford, Texas. That's a little bit, I, I think it's in between Fort Worth and Dallas or on the other side of Fort Worth. I can't remember. Huh? Other side. Other side. And uh, he, he had a ranch out there, and he'd bring those old bums and stuff out there, and, and he'd give them a place to live and, and make them work. So that's the kind of, that's kind of fella he was. But my grandmother would not serve God. She was raised up in the Depression era, and she wanted to make money. And she wouldn't serve God. And eventually, my grandmother got sick. And she had cancer. And they took her to Oral Roberts Ministries uh, meetings and all that. The healing revival was going on. And my grandmother never got healed. And I, re I don't know for a fact because I don't have the mind of God. But, you know, she turned to God. Most people, when they've known God and something like that happens and they're in a hopeless situation, they'll turn back to God. And so she prayed and got her heart right with God. You know, and she went to home to be with the Lord. Now, that's not God's best. God, you got something to say, brother? Uh -huh. Yeah. And Paul said he had decided to turn him over to Satan, turn the flesh over to Satan, that he might be saved. Yeah, yeah. And in 2 Corinthians, it shows that the guy did turn back to God, and he admonished the church to forgive him. He was talking about 1 Corinthians 5, where people uh, in disobedience by, now everybody, don't, don't try to turn people over to the devil, Okay. You let, you let people in authority do that kind of stuff. If you're a layman like me, I'm not going to go around turning people over to the devil because I'm not wise enough. But, but the Apostle Paul did because it was causing problems in the church. That's another thing. Don't cause problems in the church. You'll get in trouble real quick with the Lord because he loves his body. So that's what he told Paul. He said, why persecute me? And he was persecuting the church, but Jesus took it absolutely personal. So don't cause division and strife and, and all that kind of stuff in the church. Make sure you walk in love in the church. Make sure you walk in love out in the world, too. But guard the church. He loves the church. Jesus loves the church. So make sure that you sow peace and peace in the church and walk in love toward the members of the body of Christ so you don't get in trouble with the Lord because the Lord... I don't, want, I don't want to be chastened by the Lord. I don't want to be, uh, you know, the, David said his hand was heavy upon me. I mean, God can get through to you. He's got, he got through to me. One of the first things he does, and I don't know why I'm off, but the first thing he does is break the staff of bread. So somebody said, what's that mean? Well, your pocketbook starts being affected. How many of you, how many of you, get, how many of it gets your attention when your pocketbook's affected? <laughs> I guarantee you, that'll get your attention real quick. And if you get hungry or you get thirsty or, or if your family starts being affected, you know what I'm saying? And God's not doing it in a wrong way or an ugly way. He's doing it to turn your heart back to Him because He knows what's best for you. How many of you trust Him? How many of you trust His wisdom? I haven't always trusted his wisdom. I've all, sometimes I've thought in my life that I know better. I know what's best for me. That good-looking gal, that charming gal that I thought was just bread and butter, I found out she wasn't. And the Lord was trying to get across to me. And, you know, you, 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 you learn after a while. It's better to learn by example than by experience. How many of you know that? It's better to listen to the Word of God and what it said, I promise you the Word of God's good. I promise you it conveys truth. I promise you it'll save you from heartache and pain. Just read the book of Pro I tell you what, it would probably be, I started reading the book of Proverbs again. I used to stay in the book of Proverbs when I was younger. I'd read the book of Proverbs every day. And it would do good for everybody to read the book of Proverbs again and again and again and again. It's got a lot of good advice in there. Got a lot of practical, godly wisdom 
in that book concerning everything. It covers every aspect of life. But let's get back to spiritual gifts because I'm running out of time. But spiritual endowments or spiritual gifts that operate in the church, things pertaining to and of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and how the Spirit of God operates. Now, you know, we have to cooperate with Him. He's got a plan, you know, and we need to seek His mind. You know, He speaks what Jesus tells him to speak. He conveys that truth. But there's a plan for this service this morning. Did you know that? In the mind of God, there is a plan. There is a plan of God for your life that the Spirit of God has. Your destiny, your purpose, He has laid out. But you know, we have to cooperate with Him. We have to cooperate with Him. We can't be self-willed. And, and we've got to be able to hear Him or either sense what He wants to do. We've got to follow His leading. The other day I was on, on the way home from the farm. And I'm, I'm praying, worshiping God on the way home, giving thanks to God. And I go across the railroad track in Campty, going on to Campty Cutoff Road, and the Lord spoke to me. Now, that don't happen all the time. God don't talk to me 24 hours a day. But this was one particular time he, he, he spoke to me. And he told me, he said, I want you to look up something on Google. And I did. I looked up, he said, Natchitoches and Jerusalem are on the same, uh, let's see, longitude. No, latitude. Check that. And sure enough, it was. I was like, man, that's amazing, Lord. Why would you show me that? You know, I live on a hill out here, you know, on the top of the hill, right before it goes down into Natchitoches, and then it goes down to Hagewood. I always knew my place was God's holy hill out there in <laughs> Natchitoches. I always knew that. <laughs> I just made a joke about that, but um, I said, you know, that's amazing. And so I said, Lord, why'd you show me that? Nothing. He didn't tell me. How many of you know that serving God is mysterious? How many of you know that it's called the mystery of the gospel? What it says, isn't it? The mystery of the faith? How come? That's the big question. How come? You ever thought about that saying, how come? How come? You know, <laughs> why? Every, you know, when you're dealing with God, you're going to be dealing with mystery. He's, most of the time, God's not going to just lay everything out for you to understand everything that's going to take place and the way it's going to happen and the way it's going to unfold. He's not going to do that. What's a mystery? What do you have to do to a mystery? You've got to solve the mystery, don't you? So what do you do to solve the mystery? You seek Him. You seek Him. You know what God's, de you know what God's desiring? God's desiring a relationship. You know, what? you know how you're going to do it? You're going to draw near. You get to know Him and he shares his secrets with those that worship him. That's what the Bible says. He reveals his secrets to those that fear him. The word fear there means to worship. So, I'm just using this as an example because it's just so recent. So I asked the Lord why he showed that to me, and he never spoke to me. 
You can't make God speak to you. <laughs> How many of you know you can't twist God's arm? But I knew God's good. I knew he's, he's love, so he's not out to get me. He's not out to fool me. He's not out to deceive me, so I knew he had a reason for doing what he did. So I'm at work. This is about a month later. And I'm driving out of the parking lot, and there's a guy standing in the parking lot that I know that I work with. He's a great guy. And the Lord said, pull over there and share that with him. So I pulled over there. I said, hey, man, I just want to share a little trivia with you here, bud. I said, did you know that Natchitoches and Jerusalem are on the same latitude? And he did like this. His eyes got about that big. He said, why did you share that with me? I said, I don't know. I said, I just felt him proud. I didn't say, God told me to tell you. I said, I just felt led to tell you that. Impressed. He said, man. Now, he's Catholic, okay? He said, man, my priest just came from Jerusalem, and he told us the same thing at Mass. And it just, he said, I feel goosebumps all over me. I said, that's the presence. Somebody said, is he born again? I don't know. I drove off, and I said, uh, we talked a little bit. You know, he was excited about it, you know. I said, Lord, why did you share that with me? He said, because from now on, what you have to say, he will listen to it. I gave you credibility with him. You see, the Lord goes to whatever means he must to reach people. How many of you know the Magi were astrologers? How many of you know that astrology is wrong? But God used astro those astrologers to seek out his son. They were more interested in the Christ than the priests in Jerusalem were. They were hungry. How many of you know that God will seek out, I'm not, I'm not for astrology, please don't, don't think, but I'm telling you God will bypass all that to get to people because he loves people. You see what I'm talking about? Learning how to cooperate with him when he's doing things and not resist him and not, see people in their mind their mind can be their biggest problem because your mind doesn't understand your head is not big enough to grasp the plan of God. You can't understand God with your brain. If you did, he would be no bigger than your brain. <laughs> True, huh? Let him lead, let him guide, let him speak. Trust him. Now, I'm not telling you believe every voice or every spirit. The Bible says try the spirits. Make sure it's in line with God's word. But, I mean, we need to be able to trust him. We need to be familiar with him. The Bible said acquaint yourself with him in the book of Job. Get to know him. How do you get to know somebody? Spend time with them. Spend time with him. And it's going to take some, I'm not going to call it sacrifice because it's not really, it is a sacrifice in one sense, but it's not a sacrifice in another sense. Where you steal away, close the door, get alone with him, and spend time with him in his word, and in his presence. The Bible said, seek his face, doesn't it? And I, my heart said, thy face will I seek. That's what David said. 
So when I come into his presence, when I, when I seek his face, how do you know you're in the presence of somebody? When you can see their face. That's when you're in the presence of somebody. You're that close where you can converse. So his face is synonymous with his presence. When his presence comes, and the word face and presence are the same in the Hebrew language. When his presence comes, we need to realize that he's here. And we need to reverence that. And we need to respect that. You know, we don't need to be, if the presence of God comes and, and, and he's moving in our services, you know, we don't need to be doing things that distract people or making noise, you know, and, and talking and passing notes and need to reverence that, need to teach the children to reverence the presence when he comes because his presence brings his voice. That's when we can hear. I mean, I was sitting back there uh, Wednesday night, and uh, I, I was just listening. I mean, it wasn't goosebumps and all, but but I got a revelation Wednesday night. I mean, God just opened up a truth to me through what uh, Francis was teaching, and it totally caught me off guard. I was like, "Wow, I, I never saw that before." So whenever you come to church, you come to hear. You come to hear, you come to hear his voice. He'll reveal things to you when you come to church. People miss out by not coming to church. They don't hear the voice. You want to know what the, I'm going to read this and I'm going to shut up. Let's go to Psalms 29. Psalms 29, one of my favorite scriptures. I love this. You want to know what the voice of the Lord does? I'm going to read it to you. Psalms 29 said, Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Now this is a different version. The Lord, the God of glory, thunders. The Lord is over the many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. It's very important that we hear the voice. Very important. Because then when you hear the voice, you have direction. When you hear the voice, you have wisdom. When you hear the voice, you have faith. Because acting on the voice is the only way there is for true faith. Where you can act in absolute and total assurance. It produces these things. The voice of the Lord. So very important to be acquainted with Him. So very important to obey Him. And to honor Him and to reverence him. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time.